myself and Lopan Chandra Easton are just so grateful to have this space held for all of us each week. Um, especially in the pandemic, it has been a true refuge, um, a place where we can just come together in authenticity and look to these ancient teachings, which have just so much relevance today. So we are making our way still through the Lojong. We're, we're getting close. We're getting close. So last week, I know you were with Lobsang Tempa. I hope that was a good time. He's such a badass. I don't know a better way to say it. That's probably not the most respectful thing I can say, but he kind of blows my mind. Um, he's totally brilliant. So really grateful to have him and hope, hopefully we can rope him in for a bit more. He has a lot of wisdom to share with us. So that was a um, kind of sneak preview. So this week we are, it's a very simple slogan that we're working on. Um, and the slogan is, this time, practice the main points. This time, meaning this lifetime. <laughs> so the assumption is, if you're listening to this, if you're reading this text, uh, however many hundreds or thousands of years, that if you have the access to these texts, this is the right lifetime in which to pursue. And the main points are quite simple. The main points are to really remember benefiting others before yourself to practice the bodhicitta, and also to clock in those hours of practice, to get the tush on the kush, as they say. So I'm gonna invite us to a bit of a longer practice together this evening to start. And we'll go over this slogan, but one thing I'm looking forward to tonight is to consider our own slogan that really speaks to this one specifically. Um, I think it's, it's meaningful for us to have these phrases and words um, that can inspire and motivate us. So it's a little bit of what we'll be up to. So I invite you to find a posture knowing it'll be a bit of a longer sit. So I'm, I'm generally a 20 to 30 minute sit person as many of you may know, but we'll go a little bit longer than that because it's the end of the day, you know, it, it can be really tough to stay awake, totally okay do your best. <clears throat> it can be helpful to have your spine just a little bit, you know, if you're sitting in a chair, a little bit back off the chair can be really helpful. And a position where you're not gonna have to move that much. Stillness of the body is just such an incredible teacher for us to start developing stillness of the mind. So a posture where you can be relatively still, of course, if you're uncomfortable, you can move and shift around. Having your body be at ease is, is, is the most compassionate thing you can do. So thereby, it's an important part of our practice together. Feel your attention pouring into the space of the body. And let that attention make its way through all the edges and all the seams, exploring what it's like to be in the body in this moment.
Take a moment now to notice sensations of the body at the surface. What you can feel in the skin. Maybe areas of muscular tension. And just like the surface of an ocean, which can be choppy and churned, windblown. But deep underneath, there's a stillness. Feel or imagine connecting to that deeper stillness of the body. Any other distractions, thoughts, or sounds? You can imagine them too, like that surface chop. And keep inviting your attention to drop down into that space of deeper calm. Experiencing that deeper calm doesn't mean everything has settled at the surface. It just means we can connect to that sense of deeper ground, presence. Keep connecting to that deeper calm. The stillness of the body, followed by the silence of the inner speech. All those thoughts, incredible imagination and fantasy, inviting that to gently turn down just a bit. And doing so by following the natural rhythm of the breath. And in this case, following the breath as it breathes the body, feeling the body expand, feeling the body gently contract. So settling the speech into a natural state of silence by connecting to noticing the body being breathed.
be patient, be kind. Of course, the mind keeps populating thoughts and memories and images and fantasies. Each time, with the patience of a loving mother, keep coming back to settling the body, settling the speech, refreshing your interest and connecting to stillness and silence. And you may already get a glimpse or notice that when we settle our body and our speech, there's a bit more space and the natural openness of the heart mind reveal itself. Bringing our attention and awareness now to settling the mind and heart, inviting this quality of openness Again, like the ocean, open and vast, not free from those surface level thoughts and fantasies, memories and images, but so vast that there simply is not enough attention to go to one place and it be completely absorbed. Each time a thought, memory, or image enters the space of your attention and awareness, practice just bringing more vastness all around it. Feel or imagine the vastness of space in front of you. Above you. Behind you. Below you.
with and from this sense of spaciousness, vastness all around, above and below. will help settle the mind further by observing the thoughts as they arise. As the thought arises, notice its type. Is it planning? Is it past? Is it imagination, imagery? And with that simple label, let it dissolve back from where it came. So in this practice, we settle the mind in its natural state by observing and labeling very briefly the nature of our thoughts. Maybe you get carried away for a while by the thought train. No problem. Reestablish yourself in vastness. Or if it's helpful, focus on the breath. And then once again, observe the mind. Notice and label with simple labels the thoughts that arrive. Naturally, let them dissolve and return back from where they came, that great vastness of the mind. Keep the noticing fresh. Some of these thoughts may appear only as image, some as complete sentences. Some of these thoughts come so quickly. Some seem as though they're lingering in the back. Notice the nature of these thoughts.
when you catch yourself having gotten carried away, notice what is it that catches yourself and rest in that awareness, that knowingness. No matter how many times you have to come back, you are still deeply connecting with your practice. Gently we'll shift from this awareness, observation of thoughts, regathering our attention inward to the body. Again, feel or imagine pouring your attention into the space of the body. Feeling the ankles, knees, hips, chest, shoulders, the jaw, the forehead.
connecting to the belly, stability, solidity, <clears throat> connecting to the heart, openness, and connecting to the head centers, clarity, wakefulness. And then fully bringing our attention to that heart center. And bringing a most basic and simple aspiration of love and care for ourselves. in order for us to do the transformational practices of Tonglen, we must first make ourselves an instrument that is ready to do so, infusing our own heart with love and care. So giving yourself a moment to turn your own eyes towards your heart. seeing and feeling your struggles and difficulties and challenges. Maybe something acute right now, maybe an ongoing ache <clears throat> or heartbreak. And feel or imagine that natural desire and care for our own struggles and suffering. And using our breath through the inhale, we draw in this awareness of struggle and difficulty and suffering. And we exhale radiating an aspiration that we may be safe, we may feel at ease, we may be healthy and strong. Inhale, drawing in, connecting to our own struggles. And exhale, a heartfelt aspiration of compassion. Imagining as we are drawing in, turning towards what's hard. That with this aspiration, we can transform it here and now. We can't change necessarily the causes or conditions of that suffering. But we change how we Hold our heart with it, fully open and transparent. A couple more breaths here, just attending to our own challenges and difficulties and extending, priming the prompt of our compassion. And gently shifting and turning our gaze outward and bringing to mind someone in our life who we care for, who could really use some help right now, who's carrying a burden, 
And with this practice, we turn towards, we in fact offer to lift this burden through our breath, through our aspiration of compassion. Bring this person to mind, imagining their struggles, making it feel real, spark that flame in our heart. Inhale, drawing in and considering this struggle. And exhale, transforming with this wish of compassion. May you find happiness. May you feel at ease. May you be healthy and strong. Continue a couple more breaths with the words that are meaningful for you or simply with the feeling, no words at all, of turning towards and offering to take up some of the burden. This practice of Tonglen is not a practice in which we find ourselves falling into despair. Though, of course, what we're thinking about is hard. We find the strength of vastness. There's so much space in our heart for all the things, all the experiences and feelings, all the love. It's that glimpse of emptiness that allows our Tonglen to be a source of ongoing refreshment, not a drain. So whenever you need, reconnect to that vastness. We widen the sphere of our concern and bring to mind a place in the world right now that needs our love. There are so many to choose from. Find one where when bringing it to mind, it can feel real. And spark in our heart that natural aspiration of compassion. Gently with the confidence of vastness around us, we invite in and turn towards the suffering and difficulty with the aspiration to transform and shift with a care, kindness, and love. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale. May you find happiness. May you know peace and ease. May you be healthy and strong. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale, extending out. This practice strengthens our heart allows it to stay open amid the suffering. No matter how small it feels to wish compassion, keep the aspiration, maintain the training of an open heart. Continuing with the inhales and exhales, bringing to mind this group of people in the world and extending the radiance and love of your heart towards their suffering and challenge.
One or two last breaths here. Coming back to once again connect to the body and breath. Feel whatever fullness of presence is available. Maybe a sense of being in the body or being in a tender heart. And consider your intention for being together tonight, not just for this practice, but for every practice. Arousing your bodhicitta, our heartfelt desire to extend and open our hearts to others, to practice, to put others first. Feel the nobility and dignity of this aspiration. From a deep knowing of our belonging to each other and this planet, connect to that aspiration. Thank you all for your practice. I'd love to hear from some folks if they are interested in willing, any reflections or questions. You can raise your hand, put something in the chat. I've had a hard time before understanding that instructions of engaging the flash of emptiness before Tonglen. Uh, I find I, I know what it means conceptually that we have this greater capacity when we draw from that understanding of everything always changing. But to actually be able to Pema Chodron and, and Chogyam both write it this way flash on emptiness before Tonglen. Um, I have found that hard. So I hope in this practice, just giving ourselves that time to feel the vastness and then go into the practice. Um, I hope that was a support. Thank you, Blake, for that reflection. Glad to hear it. Yeah, 
happy to, Laura, explain a little more. <clears throat> so <laughs> as many of you may experience, it's, it's very tough in Tonglen to not start feeling kind of the heart pulling you a bit into the despair of what you're bringing to mind. So when we bring forth Tonglen, we're, we're doing, you know, in, in psychology, uh, what we do to kind of experiment on people and look at their emotions, we bring forth a memory that's painful. And what happens? We naturally get triggered to emotion. And our emotions have this really amazing innate tendency and quality to just capture our full awareness. So that flash of emptiness, it's giving us a space to remember that that emotion is temporary. It's not our entire reality. So that then we can really be with the Tonglen and do the transformation from a place of fullness. Maybe a little bit less from a place of being triggered. So instead of giving our heart while our heart feels broken open, we're giving our heart when our heart feels transparent. I use poetic terms because I don't think there's a, a technical way, but there's um, such a qualitative difference in, in feeling that when we're kind of offering from this place of, um, yeah, kind of self-related concern is what it's called technically. So when our care is really bound up and, oh God, I can't, I, I, I don't want it to be this way instead of um, you know, a place where we recognize the pain and difficulty, but it doesn't feel so personal. I hope that helps. Laura, happy to explain more if, if that would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> Alexi asks, if the person who first comes to mind is someone who is suffering and whom we care about, but is someone who emotionally dumps on us <laughs> that we need boundaries with, sorry to laugh, I can totally relate. Should we pick someone else? No, you're just doing advanced level teaching. You're combining the difficult person and the so-called cherished person, but we know that those, no one is so stable like that, right? There is such a overlap between the people we care about and the people who drive us crazy. Um, I do think it's important to point out that we don't want to use this practice transactionally. Like, God, this person dumps on me and it's a lot. And I'm just going to do this practice and try to just get over it. Just stop having to exert. Um, I do think actually maybe almost in contradiction to what we might assume, the practice can help us develop boundaries because we get to feel what it's like to extend that care and not lose ourselves or extend that care and not feel personally concerned. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it can be very challenging um, to manage our compassion. There are so many calls for it, so many ways in which the world is kind of reaching um, out to us and wants a response. Um, yeah, so people have, you know, so Laura asks, is that detached compassion? So it's, it's interesting. In Buddhism, it's often compassion can be talked about as a stance as opposed to an action. We can do compassionate action, but there's also a stance of compassion in which we don't feel we have to do. So detached sometimes has the connotation of not caring or being aloof. So we wouldn't want to fall into that aloofness, which is sometimes called the near enemy of equanimity. So you're at a place of tranquility and you can see clearly, but you just stop caring. We don't want that level of detachment, but where it doesn't feel personal, like it's happening to us or, and at the same time, we really have again, like some space around it. Could be something really, really like difficult happening to someone we really, really love. They don't want our detachment, but they also don't want us getting exhausted in our care for them. Great questions.
Any other thoughts or reflections <clears throat> on that practice before we move on to the slogan a bit more? Bless you. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to the slogan a bit more. Um, I think it's interesting for us being so far along uh, on the 51st slogan to look at the, the arch or arc rather of, of these slogans and kind of like what they're pointing out to us over time it's always helpful to kind of have that bigger view. And there are what are called seven main points under which these 50 fall. And the seven points are, are establishing our groundwork. So you might remember those as our preliminaries. We never graduate from the preliminaries. Remembering this precious human life, always, 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 always. Um, and then we get into, you know, the actual practices of um, kind of mind training. That's another big second point. And then the third point in these Lojong slogans is how do we apply it? How do we make it real into our life? So we have the basic groundwork. We have instructions on practices. And then we have how to apply it. Then if you look at the Lojong slogans in order, it can be, it can look like a long list of what not to do. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> and you know, we need a lot of that. So there are these uh, instructions that kind of summarize what's important, um, which is the fourth point. And then also ways that we're able to kind of assess and evaluate how we're doing. How are we coming along? In the sixth part, it really invites us to get committed and to think about when we are kind of violating or going against these slogans. And in where we are now in the seventh part, it's the guidelines of how to support and nurture our experience. So in this one tonight, it's, it's just kind of, I think in some ways, just the most simple one of all. And the simplicity of it is that really there is nothing more important that we can be adhering ourselves to in this lifetime than developing our practice and really getting ourselves close to a sense of understanding bodhicitta and the awakened heart. That is the most important thing. Now, I wasn't totally moved by the slogan as it's written. This time, practice the main points. Um, there's one other way that it's written. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, this time practice the main points. Now practice what is more important. I am not sure I would kind of initially go for that slogan. And it's funny after teaching this for however many weeks, I finally got interested in like, what is a slogan? Like, what does that mean? I don't think that that is a Buddhist term. Um, and when I looked at like what a slogan is, it, it, it actually made me think that these are more, a bit more like aphorisms. So slogans are very concise, pithy. Um, if you look into slogans on the internet, as one does, there's a lot of workshops on making your slogan of how to sell stuff. Um, so I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily always have this context of helping turn your mind as a Lojong slogans are supposed to do. But the aphorism is, it feels a bit closer. It's this idea of something that's kind of revealing a truth. Something that we can, you know, um, sometimes it's passed down generation to generation. It's a memorable phrase, something that, con that conveys a message that matters. So what I'd like us to do for just about three to four minutes is write down our own slogan. You don't have to do all 51 up until this point, 
just this one for tonight. So tonight, the main message, what we're trying to get across here is that uh, according to certain points of view, you might have had other lifetimes. And in those lifetimes, maybe you didn't yet wake up, which is why we're still here trying to figure this out together, but that this is the lifetime. And this is the perfect time to adhere yourself to what matters most. So these practicing of bodhicitta, really adhering ourselves to the spiritual path. And interestingly, in some of the translations, really a focus on don't read about it, practice it. Okay, so you have three minutes to write your pithy slogan. This time, practice the main points. I know that you can do better than that. I'll put that one in the chat for the general. One sentence, that's it. Well, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> My paternal grandfather was fond of, of, that, of that song of the 30s, enjoy yourself, it's later than you think, which is a little different of the ethos there. So we're actually going to give ourselves about 10 minutes in a breakout to discuss these together, giving you that fair warning. I know for some folks breakouts, not your jam. That's cool. You can stay with us in the main room and not do that and just get some tea. Um, and then we'll come back and talk about them together. Pamela and Mace, are we ready for people to zoom into their breakouts? So Introduce yourself. Wait, sorry, sorry. Before we do so, getting a little loose on my Zoom etiquette. Before we do so, we'll introduce ourselves. And we haven't done breakouts in a couple of weeks. I think it's a beautiful way for us to support uh, connection and, and deepening our understanding. It's one thing to like receive and listen. It's another to explain and connect. Um, but just to remind us that we are a community of folks who are not here to give each other advice uh, or fix each other, and that we wanna uphold more than anything our adherence to non-harming. So that means being so aware of what is coming out of our mouth, maybe even our inner speech, and as much as possible being considerate that we just don't know where people are coming from tonight. It might be a whole variety of experiences that happened today or in this life. So compassion, non-harming, not fixing. Okay, that's it. Three to four per room, is that good, Eve? That's perfect. Great. Here you go, friends. Three, two, one, last call. We're breaking out now. Open all rooms, baby. I just, you know, it was a long meditation. Hmm. <laughs>
It was a long meditation, huh? You got her no, way it was perfect. Bl- I got it was her a, super blissed it was, out. It was like technically <laughs> capacitated. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to connect with one another on those slogans. Um, yeah, be curious if anyone wanted to share them or any insights they had and uh, digging in with others. It seemed in our group that we our slogans were not just for this night, not just for this um, number 51, but in general. So any, any insights on what kinds of slogans might be most motivating for you in your practice? I do like wake up every morning, take a breath and be grateful you're alive and give joy all around. Don't wait, time is out, wake up. (laughs) be here now for others and myself I wonder if these slogans at least the way they're written in the Lojong are intentionally kind of provocative I think there's something about a slogan which almost like gets under your skin a little bit um I wonder if that is kind of sticks to something for us and like helps out a bit. Laura, we are all suffering beings. Yes, such a beautiful one. Such a great one to keep in mind. It's exactly the kind of thing you tell people and then they never want to practice Buddhism though. They're like, that sounds terrible. What do you guys do? It makes you, it makes you put up, I mean, it makes me more, uh, I think the reason I keep thinking is I keep with difficult people, I keep yeah. thinking this person must be in great pain to say these things yeah. and they don't bother me as much. Yep, exactly. Yeah, especially those who like are immediately kind of causing us challenge and difficulty. Yeah. There is no later for awakening. I agree. You know, we're so fortunate to live in, in, this, in this moment of the contemporary diaspora of, of meditation teachings. I, I know some of you are quite aware of this, but the idea that any of us could wake up really wasn't very popular 30 years ago, mm. you know? And there has been so much more of a zeitgeist and movement to question that, like, why not? Um, and I, I don't know, I kind of think I know what it might feel like to wake up. Um, And especially as I get closer and closer to um, realizing something I was talking with Pamela about before, you know, this beautiful teaching um, in the Vajrayana, which that the samsara and the nirvana are not separate. So it's not like waking up is gonna be so different, but I could imagine having less aggression and less clinging. I actually can imagine that and how incredible it would feel to be more free from that. It doesn't, that feels actually very, um, I don't know if I'd say possible, but plausible, (laughs) that possibility, really encouraging. Diane says, may my practice deepen even more so I'm of benefit to others and do no harm. Joe says, you are the author of the nightmare. Wake up from yourself. Yes, I like that one. That's a provocative one. (laughs) Yes, good. (laughs) Could you expand a little bit more on what you meant? Uh, I guess what resonated with me was what somebody, Alex, I guess I see in the chat, said about difficult people and, uh, uh, you know, trying to be compassionate but who emotional dumps on us and that we need boundaries. And you said that when we, I guess if I heard correctly, when, you, when we practice Tonglen, that we have more space to set boundaries. Could you yeah. elaborate a little bit more on that? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think 
when we think about when we kind of get specific on what's going on in that in that context of you know essentially taking on someone else's stuff right mm -hmm. so let's say it's a family member or a friend and they are struggling they have mental emotional distress and it's really difficult for them to regulate it and as humans we can regulate each other um, and our desire often is to seek that comfort and that regulation from another person. So we are, so this friend or loved one comes to us, they unload, um, and yet it might feel, if, if it feels like unloading, um, then often that person really isn't getting regulated. They continue to spin. Um, and so our, our natural desire and inclination to support them um, can feel really depleting because we don't feel a kind of success or um, efficacy. So when we're practicing, what we can do is wanna, going back to all time favorite slogan, I think it's number 11. We can practice that, <clears throat> no, sorry, it's farther along than there, maybe 20, 23, giving up all hope of fruition, mm. which is truly equanimity, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to be loving and present and caring without that agenda outcome. But that's so, that's so conceptual. So in practice, we get to feel it. Like, what is it like to have this person right here, they're suffering right here and love them by taking this on, but not losing ourselves in it. So then we practice that in an imaginal sense, uh, just like Olympians and, uh, you know, um, some of the most successful CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, they imagine, they rehearse. So we do that same thing with our Tonglen. We imagine and rehearse being present without losing ourselves. Yeah, with that, that doormat compassion that, exactly. out, that you exactly. mentioned before. Okay. And it's a felt sense, you know? And so I think that's why it's so interesting to try to practice it. Um, in meditation because we can we can feel it often in the presence of another person it's, it's just harder to feel because we get um, hijacked right we get just run away with us mm -hmm. thank you for the question yeah mm -hmm. here refuge in the three jewels beautiful yeah and i think you know i think these slogans Again, with the Lojong, I love this description. They turn our mind. So if I'm looking this way, this is all I can see. But then if I turn this way, huh? Right, so this idea that the slogans can turn our mind, they can change what we see, how we see. And that the way that they're designed, you know, especially um, as uh, Lopan Chandra and I have been doing of trying to intersperse those settling the mind in its natural state, and then these Tonglen practices, that those two can be so skillfully woven together. So we have to be able to understand the movements of our mind. I, I'm, I don't know if anyone had interesting observations on, you know, as we observe our thoughts, we watch them, some of them are fast, some of them are slow. Like we develop that ability and capacity of meta-awareness and we develop the heart together. It's really, it's such a beautiful um, combination. And if we just do one and not the other, it's, it's imbalanced, it's really off. And one of, the, um, one of the translations of this slogan tonight is around balance, find your balance. And in this case, the balance is meditate all the time. <laughs> your balance in this lifetime because you're fortunate to meet the teachings. But it, it's helpful, right? Um, you know, I, I think none of us need a guilt trip on meditating, but I, I do think it's, yeah, it's meaningful to have the slogan say, wake up, time is running out. Someone said that, time is running out. And, um, you know, I know many of you know that a lot of these practices are, are actually designed to help us prepare to die so that we know what it's like to be in our mind and know what it's like to um, 
have that sense of being able to transcend even a feeling of being in body. Um, so that great transition to the bardo, something we're preparing for with these practices. That's, an, that's encouraging. Um, it's, a, it's the best insurance plan out there. A lot of, lot of investment, tush on kush. That, so yeah, that was my slogan that I'm gonna carry forward still. Um, but it, you know, it really is, it's, it is um, so meaningful and it's harder and harder to deny uh, the difficulties in our world. Uh, we don't really get a single news cycle anymore that things aren't really tough. So being able to have this set of tools and this inspiration that comes from such a different place um, I, I've shared with you that my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood, um, says that this time we're living in is the curriculum for waking up. Perfect ingredients for waking up. So I, I try to take heart in that. Um, yeah. So in order to, yeah, make the most out of our final moments, let's dedicate our practice here together. One more time to get our tush on our kush. Taking a moment to simply reflect on our intention of coming here tonight. The motivation that brought us here. and whatever happened or didn't happen in our practice. Remembering that that in and of itself is a dedication. And if it feels comfortable and appropriate, placing your hands together at your chest as a sign of reverence and devotion to these teachings. And considering dedicating our time here together to that ultimate and relative bodhicitta with the outrageous hope that literally every being could be free. Every being could know peace and ease. That even our planet could find itself towards healing. And at the relative level, dedicating our practice that people could feel safe, be free from violence and aggression, not be hungry and no belonging. nice to be with 